Hello, my name is Raymond Vincent and welcome to a comprehensive course in Byzantine sacred art. Uh, just to give you a little biographical info about myself, I hold a Bachelor of Arts and a Master of Arts degree in sacred theology. And as you may know, theology is a, a branch of the humanities, which mean I, I, I had the, the privilege of doing most of my undergrad work in fine arts and music. And I've put both of those uh, to use in the service of the church um, as a cantor and also as a practicing iconographer. So I've taught all over the country teaching icon paintings, and I also take commissions and have done uh, a lot of actually church decoration and, and restoration. So I'm coming at this both as a as a practical, as a working you know iconographer, but also as an academic who studied the sacred tradition of the church. And I've uh, focused a lot of my, my academic energy towards not only uh, Byzantine sacred art, but the formation of, of Orthodox Christian culture in general. So I'm, I'm coming at this from lots of different angles, but it is a, a rather vast topic, this topic of the icon. Sacred iconography is ubiquitous in our Orthodox tradition. It's the central feature of Byzantine sacred art itself. But a subject this complex is almost impossible for us to treat in just one lecture series. Uh, we're going to do our best to give a general introduction, but even to give a, a, a glimpse of this tradition, we have to approach the icon from several different angles. We have to look at it art historically. Uh, also, we have to look at it theologically. Another angle we're going to cover is the practice of icons. How are they made? How are they used in our churches? And also, what is the theory behind their method of depiction? How do they communicate as a visual language? But before we can do any of this, we have to ask the basic question of what do we mean by icon? For most of us, icon means something like this. An icon painted on a wooden panel. And this is, of course, is an icon. But it's important to note that icons, or iconography uh, more generally, doesn't just mean a panel painting. There are many different forms and expressions of iconography that are used in, in, in the church and part of uh, the tradition of Byzantine sacred art. Icon simply means image in Greek, and it can refer to any sacred image used in orthodoxy in a variety of different forms. But to just start with what we're most familiar with, uh, let's talk about the, the panel icons, or the icons painted on uh, typically a wooden panel. Now there's several different mediums or uh, materials in which these panel icons can be, be painted with. Uh, the most typical is actually egg tempera. This is the traditional uh, technique that has been around for millennia. We actually have a tempera paintings from before the Christian era, so it's a very ancient medium, and it, the style of iconography developed with and in this medium, so this medium seems to be really well suited to the icon. But traditionally there's another medium that's also used, and that's encaustics. In fact, some of our earliest surviving icons were painted in encaustic paint. And encaustic paint is very interesting because the binder that's used to bind the colored pigment together, uh, unlike a tempera, which uses a, an egg yolk binder, it actually uses beeswax. And there's scholarly debate on what the exact technique uh, the ancients used in executing this technique, uh, but it's just important to note that there are different mediums, and some of our oldest and most beautiful icons are actually painted in this very, very interesting uh, medium of, of encaustic paint. Later on in the history of icon painting, uh, iconographers also used oil paints, um, and that had certain advantages and disadvantages that, that uh, we will get into uh, later in the lecture series. And uh, today, uh, some iconographers even use acrylic paint, so there's uh, lots of different ways to go about the painting, and there's lots of different mediums in which to execute these paintings. But it's important to note again that the, the painted panel is just one expression of the icon, and for large periods of Byzantine sacred art history, um, not the most ordinary or, or the most typical uh, form of the icon. 
Another form of the icon that has gone in and out of fashion throughout history is the relief icon. And these icons are carved icons, sometimes out of wood, sometimes even out of stone. and uh, often in Byzantine art history out of ivory. And a similar form of the icon is an icon executed in low relief in metal, and typically gilded metal. And these low-relief metal icons are still a normal part of our church experience today. Uh, for example, the rapidia, or the fans that the servers hold during the processions and in some traditions during the Divine Liturgy, have a reposé, or, or low base relief icon, of the angels. We also see metallic iconography on the cover of the Book of the Gospels. as well as a lot of the liturgical equipment, the vessels, the discos, um, the tabernacle. Even hand and pectoral crosses and processional crosses. So this is still a, very much a, a normal part of the iconographic uh, tradition of the church, but we don't often interpret these as icons because we, we think of icons as a painting, but these are certainly icons. Another type of icon that is still very much part of our church services are icons executed in tapestry. Historically, iconography rendered in tapestry was extremely popular. They were used as curtains for the iconostas before icons themselves were, were fixed onto the structure of the templon. Uh, but these icons are still with us today. We use them in our liturgy. Uh, in some traditions, processional banners will have tapestry icons, but uh, in most of our experience, we see these icons on the great epitaphios, or funeral shrouds, used in the burial service of Christ, and also in the uh, preparations for the Feast of the Dormition of the Mother of God. But even these tapestry icons actually developed out of liturgical, uh, liturgical cloths that also had rich iconography on them, and still do today. Uh, the most notable example is the Antimension, which will often have that same scene of the Epitaphios or even the Descent from the Cross or something that has to do um, with the Passion of the Lord, and that will be the main cloth used on the altar during the Divine Liturgy. So, tapestry icons are still part of our liturgical experience. Um, this also includes icons that are rendered on vestments, and really all of, the, all of the cloths that we use for our services, it is suitable to have iconography on them. Another form of iconography in our tradition is illuminated manuscripts. So, any of the books that the Church uses, like the lectionary, or the Psalter, or the Horologia, or even our service books, um, they can be richly decorated with iconography, but, uh, you know, on, in the form of illumination or printing. So this is another and actually very important form of Byzantine sacred art, of iconography that has transmitted our tradition throughout, throughout history. It's actually still very much alive and well today. If you ever see a good lectionary, it will often have very rich uh, iconography associated with it. But by and large, the premier example of Christian or of uh, Byzantine iconography in particular is the iconography that decorates our churches. 
And this form of iconography, again, just like panel painting, has a variety of different media. The most prestigious media is actually the form of mosaics. So mosaics are iconography that are rendered in little tiles, little tiles called tresserae, which just means four-sided, and they're square tiles made out of sometimes stones, uh, sometimes uh, colored ceramics, and sometimes glass. And oftentimes, they're, they're very beautifully uh, rendered in gold, so they're actually be gold leaf that's stuck um, to the bottom side of glass that creates almost a, a, a golden mirror that will um, be cut into tesserae, and that will adorn the interiors of the churches. And mosaics, as I've stated, was the most prestigious form of church decoration, uh, predominantly because of how it interacted with light. The Byzantines really developed uh, mosaics to, to, the, to the highest possible form of, of artistic excellence, and they would actually tilt each individual little tile so it caught the light in just the right way. And that meant when you entered into these churches and when light entered into these churches, the whole building would just glow and resonate and sparkle. And uh, that is very much a part of our tradition, but unfortunately not, not something we see uh, normally in our, in our church experience. Another form of, of wall painting is what we call fresco. Now fresco is just an uh, Italian, or simplifying the Italian phrase uh, meaning wet or fresh plaster. So what fresco is, is a painting that's executed, but the paint itself is just the pigments, just that colored uh, powder mixed with water. And this is painted directly onto this wet plaster before it cures, and it soaks into that plaster, and as the plaster cures and, and, and chemically solidifies, it seals in and locks in those colors, and the paintings literally become part of the wall, uh, which makes fresco a, a very beautiful but also very durable medium. So much of the iconography we're going to be exploring in these lectures were actually executed in these various media in, uh, in mosaic, and in fresco. And yet another form of wall painting is what we call mural. And the only difference between mural and fresco is that fresco is executed again on wet plaster, while as mural is executed on dry plaster with normal paint. Uh, classically, egg tempera, uh, today maybe acrylic paint. Actually, acrylic paint was, was developed for mural painting, um, and mural can be just as beautiful as fresco. Um, the problem is it's not very durable, so a lot of the uh, murals that we'll uh, be looking at in this class, you'll notice that they're, they're flaking and a lot of the paint is missing. That's because it, mural is not nearly as durable as fresco, which actually becomes literally part of the wall, part of the church building. Today, uh, unfortunately, partic uh, particularly in the United States, we don't have a lot of permanent church architecture, so we don't really build buildings to last centuries. So what most iconographers do, and, and myself included, when uh, commissioned with murals or church decoration, is we actually paint it on canvas, and then the canvas is adhered uh, to the wall of the building. So there's lots of different ways to go about wall painting or, or decorating the churches in our tradition. Uh, the main point is, is that so much of Byzantine sacred art, uh, Byzantine iconography, doesn't really have to do with the, the panel icon itself, but actually the church decora de decoration. So that's just a basic sketch of what we're referring to when we say icon or when we talk about the iconographic tradition. But the deeper meaning of what icon means to us as, as Orthodox Christians is that it is a tradition, indeed part of the sacred tradition. Which is to say icons aren't just about individual self-expression or, or preference for this or that art or this depiction or that depiction. It's really the visual language of the Eastern Church, of the Byzantine Church in, in particular, that is fully integrated in every other aspect 
of our orthodoxy, uh, whether it be our theology, our liturgy, our spirituality. Icons developed and were molded by the whole tradition as such. And that's why we have to, to approach them with this, um, you know, a particular study, because it's such an ubiquitous part, an important part of our tradition, just as much as, you know, chant or a musical tradition. And another reason why icons would necessitate a, a little more in-depth study is because as a visual language, oftentimes, uh, just over through the, the course of history, we've almost forgot that language. We no longer know how to speak it. And for some of us who are, are converts to the, to the Holy Faith, uh, we never learned how to speak it. And, uh, you know, it's very common for people to think that that the iconography, iconography of the church is mysterious or, or, you know, speaking in these hidden ways and hidden messages, but it's really the other way around. Iconography was an attempt to reveal and proclaim with clarity the, the mysteries of the faith. Um, and it's really because we no longer know how to speak their language that the message sometimes isn't uh, coming in very clearly. But with like any language, it's just a matter of gaining familiarity and, and becoming fluent. So that's really the goal of this lecture series, to, to introduce you to the basic aspects of the tradition, the history, the theology, the praxis, so you can develop that basic vocabulary and grammar, and over time learn how this tradition speaks to you and how it speaks to us as Christians, uh, you know, more generally, how it cooperates with our liturgical, communal, and spiritual lives. And lastly, I will note that I'm going to be, be putting a very strong emphasis on approaching our, our topic through the lens of art history, of Byzantine art history. And there are really two reasons why I think that's a, a very important approach rather than a, a strictly theoretical or strictly um, uh, theological approach to the Byzantine icon. One of the reasons behind this, uh, this emphasis on an art historical approach is that even people who study Eastern Christianity academically don't often realize just how well established and how large and vast and deep the whole realm of Byzantine art history really is. I mean, there's just a wealth of scholarship that's an established field of art history uh, that uh, I think it's well overdue for a rapprochement between people who study Byzantine sacred art or, or devote their lives to the study of Byzantine sacred art and those who produce Byzantine sacred art and those who use Byzantine sacred art and, and who explore Eastern Christianity, um, you know, as their practice, but also as, as an intellectual. So there's this vast realm of scholarship that, that really needs to be tapped into. Uh, so that's part of my focus. So we do have this vast wealth of scholarship in Byzantine art history. Um, but the reason why I also want to focus on it is because I, I do believe that's the best way to really learn the language of the icons and to sort of an apply an analogy um, from biblical interpretation. Uh, one of my professors during my, my graduate work uh, just pointed out almost in passing uh, a concept in biblical scholarship that really stuck with me. And he said, you know, biblical scholarship is not about taking these texts and dissecting them and trying to figure out what the historical context of every, you know, individual passage is. Um, you know, that's, that's a lot of work. And there's a, a famous uh, trope in biblical theology or biblical scholarship more generally that says, you know, if the text isn't dead before you start dissecting it, it, it certainly is afterwards. Um, but that's not really what we're trying to do. What we're trying to do is, is, is keep in mind that when that text was written, it made perfect sense, at, at least to the author. Maybe the listener didn't, didn't quite understand what was being communicated, but to the author, it made perfect sense. The text wasn't written to be necessarily cryptic or ambiguous or its meaning so veiled. What makes it hard to understand is the, the hermeneutical gap between the text and the contemporary reader or listener. It's because 
our our chronology you know it, it is so vastly uh, distant and our culture and worldview are so distant so in order to interpret these texts it's not so much about figuring out what each individual you know word or passage means but closing that gap and part of how we do that or, or the most important part of how we do that is in scholarship what's called historic or gaining a historical sympathy we can understand how people in that time thought, what was going on, what their worldview was, and we close the gap by being sympathetic. We can think within that historical context, and that's how we really go about interpretation. And with Byzantine art, it, or in art history in general, it's almost the same procedure. Uh, these iconographic tropes really weren't meant to be obscure, to need, you know, uh, translation. They were perfectly intelligible in the vis visible lang uh, visual language that was, you know, contemporary at the time. Icons are, were meant to communicate in this visual language. So it's really, again, that, that epistemic or, or hermene herm hermeneutical gap between uh, those who produce the art and those who see the art today that makes them, you know, unintelligible. And when we learn art historically, when we can see where these individual tropes in history came about and what their in original meaning and function were, that really does close the gap. So we're taking a, a very art historical approach for that, that reason, that we don't necessarily need to go to each individual icon and have me lecture, you know, this is what this detail means and that's what that de detail means. When we see it in historical context, how these different layers of the visual language developed, then it's just a matter of going um, to the, the art, to the icon, to the depiction, and having that historical memory, having that, that, that uh, familiarity with how that language works because we understood how it developed, then we can actually um, use that visual language and the icons become truly communicative. So that's the reason we're taking such a, a strong emphasis on an art historical approach rather than uh, what a lot of people do, which is more of a theoretical approach. We will address icon theory, the theory of depiction, but even that is contextualized in art history, how how these theories developed out of late Greco-Roman um, uh, methodologies and approaches to art uh, in general. So we won't spend a lot of time dissecting individual images um, but really more about gaining the fluency and learning this language uh, that, that, like I said, it is the, the uh, visual language of, of Orthodox Christianity.